Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to FMC's fourth edition of First Friday. Uh, my name is Tom Wharton, and I am the North American sales manager for the pest business within the FMC's professional solutions. I want to take a minute to thank you all for taking the time to join us this morning. This is the 25th anniversary of Tile Star Professional Insecticide. It's hard to believe that Tile Star is 25 years old and it is truly a world-class product. And FNC is celebrating by having a, sweep, a sweepstakes in which we will be giving away a Ford F-150. So on behalf of FMC and all the team within the pest business, I want to thank you all for taking the time. We thank you for your business. And now I'll turn it over to Ed Damask and he will set up everything to get on with the training. Thank you again. Thanks, Tom. Appreciate it. Um, I'll be brief. I just want to give you guys some information about upcoming webinars and uh, give you details on our CEUs. Right now in the chat, I am going to place a link to register for next month's webinar. There you should see it. It ends with First Friday webinar five. On June 4th, we're doing understanding formulations and their uses. Uh, so if you wanna mark that date down, uh, you can register right now if you want, you can bookmark that. Um, should be an exciting webinar. Now the follow-up from today's will go out on Monday. That will give details on your CEUs for each state. Um, what we have here, sorry, let me switch over. Uh, we're registered today in Arizona, California, Colorado, Connecticut, Delaware, District of Columbia, Florida, Georgia, Hawaii, Indiana, Maryland, Massachusetts, Michigan, Montana, Nevada, Pennsylvania, South Carolina, Texas, Utah, and West Virginia. We're offering CEU credits through all of those states. Uh, if you're in another state, uh, we're still efforting for future webinars, keep that in mind. A um, Couple things during this presentation, uh, to make sure that everybody is engaged at some point, uh, twice during his presentation, where Kim will have a keyword on the screen that you're gonna need to type into the chat box. Okay, just to make sure that everybody is still uh, actively engaged. Um, then at immediately following his presentation, I'll put a link to a quiz in the chat. It takes about four minutes. We'd like you to do that while we're on the webinar. And then after that, we'll have Q&A. So with all that, I'll turn it over to Rick Kim. All right, sounds good. And Sam, I think I can share my screen, right? Um, you should so Sam, be able to now. Okay. And there we go. All right. Thanks for coming. All right. Good evening, everyone, or good morning. Sorry. Um, so my name is Rakim Turnipseed, and I am the product development manager for insecticides at FMC in the Global D Global Specialty Solutions Group. Uh, and today I will be giving you your training on spider and scorpion control. All right. So starting out, uh, just some quick facts about spiders and scorpions, as they are quite interesting. Um, so they are arachnids not insects, um, so that is a major difference. Um, and there are nearly 40,000 spider species world, worldwide and over 1,500 scorpion species worldwide. So you have quite a bit more spider species uh, than you do scorpions, but um, those numbers are less than uh, the class insecta uh, where you have many, many more uh, species. Um, another interesting fact, so all spiders spin silk, but not, but not all spiders make webs. Um, and you'll hear some examples of that in a moment. Um, interesting fact, so uh, when, you, when you adjust uh, for materials, silk is five times as strong as, as steel. 
So the uh, silk that spiders spin is actually quite strong. And so you may have seen all kinds of organisms that are uh, held within spider webs. And you know, a lot of times those organisms are much larger than uh, the spider itself. And that's because uh, it's quite re resilient material. Um, some spiders can run two feet per second. So you have some very fast spiders. Um, spiders do not chew food, they liquefy and slurp it. And scorpions are nocturnal. They hunt for prey at nighttime. Uh, a lot of people uh, claim to, to see scorpions in the daytime. And while that is not uh, in something that is impossible, uh, it certainly can happen. They are primarily active uh, at nighttime. Um, and so among all the spiders and scorpions, only a small minority are actually painful and aggressive attackers and venomous. Uh, and so in the spiders, those are your, your black widow species, as well as the brown recluse species. And among the scorpions, it would be the, the bark scorpion uh, primarily, which we will talk about in detail in a bit. So just to give you an overview as to what we'll cover in today's presentation. So we'll talk about uh, life cycles of spiders and scorpions. Um, we'll get some more into spider biology and behavior, scorpion biology and behavior. Uh, and then we'll talk about uh, some management uh, strategies that you can use, uh, inspection, uh, and then as a part of uh, the tail end of that conversation, uh, we'll mention uh, Tau Star and Scion as being two primary products that uh, we would recommend for the control of spiders and scorpions. And so we'll just uh, highlight some sections of the label uh, where we talk about spiders and scorpions. Uh, and then we'll get into some prevention tips and uh, at that point, we'll uh, do Q&A uh, and wrap up. All right, so spider biology. So general characteristics of spiders are that they possess two body segments. So they have the cephalothorax and the abdomen. And so you can see the, the cephalothorax is really a combination of the head and thoracic region. Uh, you know, in insects, uh, the, the body segment is split into three. Uh, the head is its own segment, um, whereas in this case, uh, it's combined with the uh, thoracic region. Uh, they possess eight legs. They do not have wings. And as I mentioned before, um, not all spiders spin webs, uh, but they all spin silk. So they spin silk with a modified appendage on the end of their abdomen called a spinneret. And so this uh, spinneret, you know, when it produces silk and, you know, if they uh, make webs as well, uh, there are primary uh, reasons for why spiders would do this, um, primarily for prey capture, uh, harborage construction, uh, egg sac production, as well as locomotion. Um, and when I talk about locomotion, uh, because the other ones are intuitive, you know what I mean. Uh, but in case you don't know what I mean by locomotion, so when webs are constructed, uh, spiders are able to get a sense for when something has uh, made contact with the web based off the vibrations that they will feel. Um, so they can uh, detect movement of prey uh, through their webs, even if they are not in direct contact with the prey. Um, and then spiders uh, lay eggs that hatch into spiderlings. Um, of course, uh, there are always exceptions. Uh, and a primary um, exception to this would be uh, if you think of your, your wolf spiders, in, in that case, the female will actually uh, have the egg sac attached to the end of her abdomen and then the eggs hatch and they uh, are carried on her back, uh, which is actually a characteristic that is not exhibited by most spiders. And it is a characteristic commonly exhibited by scorpions. So the general life cycle of spiders. Um, so you start with the egg stage that develop in a sac-like structure uh, from the, the silk uh, or within the silk that is produced uh, by the female. Um, and you have the egg sac uh, that is then held on uh, a web if the, the spider produces web. And that provides protection to the eggs until they hatch into spiderlings at which case, uh, at which point they then undergo several molts uh, prior to, to reaching adulthood. And so uh, the average, you know, depending on species would be between, you know, five to 
seven molts um, prior to reaching adulthood. And then the life cycle uh, continues uh, once the uh, spiderlings reach adulthood, reach maturation, um, sexual maturation, and then they repeat the life cycle. And like I said, of course, there are exceptions like with wolf spiders, right? They don't make webs, uh, but uh, otherwise, generally, uh, this would be how the general life cycle would go. So when we think about spider identification, um, you know, just like with uh, other insect pests, right? You know, it's, it's always a good thing if you can narrow down what specific uh, pests that you're dealing with. Um, particularly when there are public health implications. Uh, so even though the, my, the majority of spiders that we run into are not venomous to the point of concern, uh, you do have your Southern black widow species as well as the brown recluse species uh, that are highly venomous uh, species. And notice, um, you know, when I say highly venomous, that does not necessarily even mean uh, very aggressive. Uh, it just means that their venom does tend to be quite potent. So if you do make contact uh, with this spider, with either of these spiders, um, you know, it can be quite, quite a uh, dangerous situation. Um, and so what I wanna do is go through several of these species um, in detail, um, just so you can familiarize yourselves with the uh, the suite of different uh, species uh, that there are within the spiders. So starting off, you have your, your black widow spider. And the black widow spider is probably recognized by most of you. Um, you know, it's characteristically uh, jet black uh, and shiny, and it has a characteristic red hourglass on the underside of the abdomen in the females. Um, and so this is actually a really nice uh, example of a, a black widow uh, here uh, in the image. And they mainly incur in southern regions of the United States. Uh, they have been known to, you know, slightly expand their range beyond that, but they are primarily uh, in, the, in the southern U.S., or in, that's at least where they are of most concern. Uh, and they prefer dry, dark, and protected areas. So the areas that they would tend to be inhabiting are going to be underneath stones and decks. Uh, hollow tree stumps, firewood piles that are, uh, you know, laid out around properties, uh, as well as sheds and barns. Um, you know, and I've seen cases where people are uh, in heavily wooded areas, and the shed is detached from the actual house structure, um, and it's further out into the, uh, the wooded area in the backyard. And that is a, you know, really a conducive uh, situation for for black widow spiders. Um, they uh, and particularly because it's an undisturbed area as well. Uh, sheds that tend to be detached in, in vegetated areas. Uh, they spin webs near ground level primarily, um, and they are a public health threat. So as I mentioned, um, they are highly venomous, and the females are quite aggressive, and they will definitely try to bite. Um, if you are close by her eggs, um, because they will do that to guard their eggs. They will exhibit an aggressive uh, behavior and oftentimes will bite you. Um, and some symptoms that you could experience with that are fever, increased blood pressure, sweat, and nausea, all which can last anywhere between, you know, one to a few hours, though um, there have been cases where, you know, symptoms can last a lot longer. And in some rare cases, you know, the, the bite has been known to be fatal. Um, that is not typically the case, even if you're bitten by a black widow, uh, but it definitely is a uh, type of incident that, that can occur with this species. So overall, the black widow spider is a uh, highly aggressive spider, a highly venomous spider, and it's one of the ones that we are primarily concerned with from a public health standpoint. Then you have your brown recluse spider. Um, so the brown recluse, recluse looks quite different than the black widow spider. Um, it is light to dark brown uh, with dark brown violin marking on its um, back. Um, and you actually, depending on some species, you don't actually see that violin marking and actually not some species and some insects 
sorry, not insects, in some organisms, my, my bad, uh, in some organisms that uh, marking is not that prevalent. Um, and in some cases, not even there. But what is always the case is that that coloration, that light to dark brown coloration. Um, and this, they are primarily uh, present in the central Midwest, uh, as well as southwest, southwestern, um, southward of Georgia uh, to Texas uh, as well. So they uh, commonly inhabit the, the southern United States, Georgia to Texas, as well as the, uh, the central Midwest. Um, they inhabit warm, dry, and dark areas. Uh, they are attracted to debris and wood piles. Uh, they are found under furniture, storage items, baseboards, window moldings, um, closets, attics, crawl spaces. Um, and with the case of brown recluse, um, oftentimes when people are trying to monitor for it, they will actually, and it is recommended to put sticky traps uh, underneath furniture because they do tend to inhabit furniture. That is a, uh, an attractive space for them. And they tend to prefer to eat small insects, uh, small cockroaches, uh, as well as crickets. Um, those tend to be uh, great sources of protein for these spiders. Um, and they are also a public health threat. So unlike the black widow spider, right, uh, they are not as aggressive. However, when they bite, and they tend to bite when they are provoked, uh, they are highly venomous. So they're not as aggressive as the black widow, but they are uh, highly venomous as well. And the symptom that you would tend to see with uh, br brown recluse spiders is uh, an open ulcerating sore. So again, um, just like the black widow, the brown recluse is uh, one of uh, public health concern. Cellar spiders. So cellar spiders are pale white, tan or cream in color with dark contrasting markings. And they have these characteristic long legs. And oftentimes we will call them uh, daddy long legs, um, but this should not be mistaken with the, the other um, organism that is known as daddy long legs, which is the, the harvestman, um, which is not uh, a cellar spider. Cellar spiders are actually quite uh, common and they are found throughout the United States and uh, most parts. Um, so this is a species that is uh, commonly in, encountered uh, by many. Um, and they like warm, dark, and damp areas. And so they will often be found inhabiting crawl spaces and basements, uh, sheds, uh, as well as garages. Um, and they exhibit a unique characteristic where uh, they will vibrate their webs rapidly when they feel threatened. Um, and they also shed legs. They're known to shed their legs to escape predators. So oftentimes if a predator manages to get a hold of a cellar spider, um, and if the cellar spider is having a difficult time uh, managing that, uh, it will shed its leg uh, quickly to, to escape uh, predation. Um, cellar spiders are not generally a uh, cause for concern uh, as it pertains to, to public health. And you have your wolf spiders. So wolf spiders are usually brown, but they can appear black with contrasting spots or stripes. Uh, and they are often mistaken for tarantulas. However, they are not tarantulas. Uh, and they too are found throughout the United States like the, the cellar spiders. Um, they are found primarily on exterior structures uh, with dense landscaping. Um, and they tend to enter indoors underneath um, under, they tend to enter indoors underneath door openings or through cracks and walls. Um, however, they do not typically breed indoors. They will typically breed outdoors. Um, and they exhibit a unique behavior and not unlike some other species, um, but they do exhibit a behavior that's not exhibited by all spiders uh, where they carry their egg sacs, egg sacs by attaching uh, them to the spinneret which again is that appendage on the uh, end of their abdomen that they use to uh, spin silk. Um, however, even though they do spin silk, they do not typically spin webs. That is not a common characteristic associated with wolf spiders. And they too are not associated with public health generally. So not typically a cause for concern, but of course, uh, very much still considered to be a, a pest. So then you have your house spiders. So house spiders have a yellowish uh, brown coloration with an elongated abdomen. 
and they too tend to be found throughout the United States. And this is the species that actually is most commonly found indoors as the name uh, house spider would suggest. Um, and they primarily will be found typically in garages, uh, sheds, and barns, although they can be found in any parts of uh, a building, building structure. Uh, they can also be found outdoors spinning uh, webs around windows and under eaves. Um, so even though they are called house spiders, uh, they can definitely and most certainly be found uh, outdoors as well. Uh, but if they are found outdoors, they're typically found on um, building structures. Um, and they are not usually found outside of their web. So usually when you see a house spider, it will be on its web or not far from its web. Um, females can lay more than 3,500 eggs in their lifetime, which is actually quite impressive. Um, and they are not typically associated with public health. So, you know, all of the other spiders the species that I'm mentioning are not going to typically be associated with public health beyond uh, those first two that I mentioned, uh, the black widow and the brown recluse. But again, still very much a, a pest. Then you have your yellow sack spider. So yellow sack, sack spiders uh, tend to have tan legs and a uh, tan head with a bright yellow abdomen. And they are primarily found in the eastern United States, as well as from the Northeast to, to the Midwest. And they are typically found outdoors rather than indoors, but they can enter and breed within buildings. But again, they tend to prefer being outdoors. Uh, and they tend to rest in a small silky sack during the daytime. And those sacks usually are found in corners along baseboards, uh, ceilings, if they do make their way indoors, um, um, beneath bark and around door frames, uh, primarily uh, outside. Uh, they tend to hunt at night and sometimes uh, crawl onto people when sitting. They are known to crawl on people when people are uh, in a sitting position. Um, and so from a public health standpoint, so they are not known to be uh, very venomous. However, they uh, do tend to bite and they actually are thought to be one of the more, freq more, more fre frequently biting uh, species among other species in the United States. And that bite tends to be associated with some mild pain, not always, but often that is the case. Uh, then you have your hobo spider. Uh, so hobo spiders are characteristically brownish gray with markings, uh, and they tend to have light stripes that run down the, the middle of their sternum. And they are primarily found in the Pacific Northwest, uh, as well as the Great Basin. And uh, the, the funnel web spiders, they spin flat webs that have a funnel shaped retreat on one end. So that is uh, a characteristic of funnel web spiders specifically. Um, and webs are built near cracks or holes. Um, so, and, and these will often be associated with uh, basements, crawl spaces, uh, garages, dense vegetation, and, and the like. Uh, females don't usually leave uh, webs, um, but males and immatures uh, will tend to leave uh, the webs. So females tend to stay close by, close by the web. Um, and from a public health standpoint, they, the only time that the hobo spider tends to bite is uh, out of a defensive uh, reflex when uh, coming into contact with humans, but it does not tend to proactively uh, bite humans, uh, so it is not considered an aggressive uh, spider species. Uh, and when they do bite, uh, it tends to be associated with mild pain, um, and some wounds may develop, but that is not always the, the case uh, with the hobo, hobo spiders. So at this time, um, you know, if you take a look at the screen uh, and follow the directions here, uh, as indicated by Ed earlier, prior to us moving on, Take a minute for everyone to do that. Okay, 
So we'll go ahead and move forward now. All right, so now we will transition into scorpions. So scorpions, um, like spiders, are arachnids. Um, so they are not insects, as indicated earlier, but they look quite different from spiders. Uh, so uh, they have characteristic uh, long, elongated bodies, uh, eight legs. They do not possess wings. And they have a segmented tail uh, with a stinger attached. Um, and very much characteristic of scorpions are these pair of large pincher-like pedipalps that they have. Um, which uh, they make ready use of. Um, they also have this unique characteristic where they glow under black light. And there have been a lot of theories um, in the scientific community about why uh, they have developed it, that adaptation. Um, but we, we do know why they uh, glow under black light. Um, and then they also tend to give birth to, to live uh, scorplings uh, that are carried on their backs by the females. So just transitioning into specific species of scorpions, you have the Arizona bark scorpion. And this has a characteristic tan body with, darker, with a darker back. And it does tend to glow a bright blue color under UV light. Uh, many people have come into contact with uh, this scorpion and uh, that is uh, the common color that tends to be described when uh, a, a black light is used. Um, and then they are primarily found in the southwest part of Arizona, as well as Southern California, although they are also found in southwestern New Mexico as well. They prefer riparian or streamside habitats under rocks and tree bark, and they actively forage um, at different points in time in the day, uh, but primarily at nighttime. They are known to be seen in the daytime, but they are primarily uh, going to to be foraging uh, at night. Unlike other scorpions, uh, they are not associated with bur burrowing. So they don't show a burrowing characteristic uh, behavior. Uh, and usually they're seen crossing trails at night. So usually when people do spot uh, Arizona bark scorpions, they are typically crossing trails. Uh, and females give birth to live young. And when they give birth to live young, it's gonna typically be between 30s, 40, sometimes even 50 uh, scorplings held on their backs for a period of about three weeks. Um, they can live quite a while at about five to seven years. And they are definitely a public health concern. This is considered to be the most venomous scorpion in North America. Um, and it, it is the most uh, commonly encountered uh, species seen in the Grand Canyon. So, this is a uh, scorpion that we are concerned with, not only from a pest standpoint, but also a public health standpoint. Then you have your striped bark scorpion. Uh, and the striped bark scorpion uh, has a tan body with two broad blackish stripes that go down the dorsal side of the abdomen, as you can see here in the picture. Um, and it tends to primarily be found in the mid mid part of the United States um, and most heavily concentrated in Texas. Uh, it tends to be found foraging both indoors and outdoors um, in damp, cool areas under rocks, boards, uh, dead vegetation. Um, and just like the Arizona bark scorpion, uh, the striped bark scorpion, like others in, in this family Bufidae, uh, they do not burrow. And they are most frequently, they are, this is considered to be the most frequently encountered scorpion in the United States. Uh, females also give birth to live young and carry about the same number of scorplings on their backs for the same period of time. And they tend to live uh, for the same period, around the same period of time as the uh, Arizona bark scorpion. Um, and from a public health standpoint, uh, their stings uh, can be painful that produce uh, swelling and itching. Um, but they are not known to be nearly as venomous as the, uh, the Arizona bark scorpion. Then you have the Arizona hairy scorpion. And I want you guys to pay attention because uh, it'll show up on your quiz. You know, you have your Arizona bark scorpion, then you have your Arizona hairy scorpion. Um, so with the Arizona hairy scorpion, uh, the top of the body is darker 
brown, while the rest of the body tends to be yellow, uh, covered with very small, fine hairs. And the Arizona hairy scorpion is the largest scorpion in the United States. And it's primarily found in uh, Southern California to Arizona, Nevada, and Utah. It's adapted to hot and dry conditions. Uh, and it is a burrowing species, um, but it's oftentimes found under rocks, logs, and wood piles. Um, and it tends to come indoors for water. And in that case, it would tend to inhabit bathrooms, kitchens, crawl spaces, attics, and closets, uh, as well as some other places that might be providing uh, ample uh, humidity and source of, sources of water. Um, and so even though they will often look for humid environments, uh, they are adapted to very hot, dry conditions. Um, and from a public health standpoint, they do not tend to be as venomous uh, as the Arizona bark scorpion. So the Arizona hairy scorpion is not known to be very venomous. Uh, the striped-tailed scorpion. So this is brown, it has brownish tan stripes on its back. Um, and then uh, the tail tends to be thicker or quite thick in relation to the, uh, the pedipalps. So you, in other scorpion species, the end of the tail uh, tends to be thinner. And so this is a medium-sized species, uh, primarily found in the Sonoran Desert, Arizona, and southwestern New Mexico. It also is a burrowing species, typically found in humid, sandy environments, but it is also very much adapted to desert conditions. Uh, it, it can often be found in sleeping bags, shoes, boxes, suitcases, and other objects. Um, so this will often be encountered uh, in areas that are inhabited by humans um, or things that humans pick up or, you know, again, put their feet in like their shoes. Um, and it's not known to be very um, venomous. It is slightly venomous, but not so much to where it's dangerous unless you're allergic. So just overall summary, uh, similarities between spiders and scorpions are they're arachnids. Uh, the immatures look like adults. Uh, they are predatory um, and they all can invade indoors, um, but the differences are seen in their modes of envenomation. So spiders use their fangs uh, for, to, to uh, place venom, uh, whereas scorpions uh, use their tail stinger. Uh, scorpions have those pinchers, whereas spiders do not, of course, and spiders have spinnerets uh, to produce silk, whereas scorpions do not. So areas where you would commonly find uh, spiders um, you again these are indoor environments near baseboards you know you can find them in bathrooms uh, you can see some tunnels uh, being created um, you know and that often will happen in basements uh, and sheds uh, and then just other furniture that you could find indoors and outdoors uh, and when you look at scorpions they are often associated with very similar environments uh, that spiders are associated So from a management standpoint, so if we get into uh, inspection and prevention, and this is really going to pertain to both. So really you wanna look at an integrated approach to spider and scorpion management. Um, and this is gonna include some uh, preparatory, cultural, physical, and chemical measures of uh, control. And so the first step would be to perform a very thorough inspection of the premises and structures in order to you know, really get a, to determine like the scope of infestation. You wanna know how bad the infestation is and those conditions that are gonna be conducive to spider and scorpion uh, entry into homes. Um, you want to also identify the species. Uh, that's often helpful to determine whether a threat to uh, occupant health uh, exists. Um, when you think about vegetation, so pruning trees and shrub branches away from structure surfaces uh, is really necessary to prevent spiders and scorpions from bridging onto buildings. So that's really what would help them get into buildings uh, if they have uh, a way to bridge onto those surfaces. So the more that you can cut down on those trees and shrubs uh, away from the surface of structures, uh, the, the less opportunity they will have to bridge onto those surfaces and get indoors. Um, and on a related note, tall vegetation like flowers and, you know, some turf grasses and weeds uh, should be cut, you know, mowed down and removed from the foundation perimeter. Uh, 
porches and entry points of buildings. Uh, this will also help. Um, I mentioned firewood earlier for several of these uh, organisms and how they are associated with firewood. So stacks of firewood should be relocated to areas away from buildings uh, to reduce uh, entry potential. Um, and then one thing that you might not think about uh, that you really should think about and for both of these organisms is uh, the uh, eliminating their food source, which are insects. So one way to do this is by um, having outdoor lighting uh, converted from white incandescent, which is a common type of light used, uh, converted from white incandescent or mercury lamps, which are attractive to insects, to more yellow or amber incandescent uh, lamps or sodium, sodium vapor lamps. And these are known to be less attractive to nocturnal flying insects. So again, the point I want to mention here is in order to really effectively control spiders and scorpions, you want to also make sure you're eliminating their prey, which are going to be insects. So I mentioned reducing or converting light is one way to reduce insects. And then of course, a chemical control that you would be using anyway is also going to help uh, with that. Um, you also want to use sticky traps. Um, and in the case of brown recluse specifically, uh, you, you want to use them underneath furniture where brown recluse spiders uh, tend to inhabit, um, but sticky traps are useful for monitoring and trapping uh, other uh, species as well. And of course, insecticides uh, can be applied at label rate and directions to make perimeter treatments of building foundations, upper structural recesses, uh, as well as um, spot treatments and other label treatments indoors as well. Um, so really all of these uh, measures is what we would call an integrated uh, pest management approach uh, to controlling spiders and scorpions. And we'll get more into that in a minute, but uh, at this time we'll do another code, code entry. So follow the directions again and type the following code word uh, into the chat box. Take a few more seconds for that. Hey, but Kim, while you're while you're doing this, I just want to remind everybody: feel free to put your questions in the Q and A box. Uh, since we've got a lot of info going in the chat, feel free to put in questions in that separate Q and A box. All right, so now we will move forward. So I mentioned earlier that Towstar and Scion are two uh, great products that are both labeled for spiders and scorpions. Um, and so you might be wondering, um, well, when would you use one over the other? And there are just some factors to consider, um, you know, differences and, you know, the two formulations are, are different. Um, and in the case of Scion, it was uh, uniquely formulated to uh, withstand very harsh, extreme conditions. And we had those very uh, hot, dry, you know, well sunlit areas uh, that are exposed to lots of sunlight um, in mind when we went into development of the formulation. Um, so both products can be used for spiders and scorpions. Um, and Scion uh, specifically uh, was formulated to, to be effective in very extreme conditions. Um, and most of you may already be familiar with Scion um, by this point, um, but it is a new standard uh, for, for pest control. It's a very effective formulation. Uh, it's associated with immediate control as well as continuous residual. Um, and these are just some uh, specific uh, talking points here related to Scion. It has a readily available active ingredient for immediate control, uh, which is gamma cyhalothrin. It has defined active ingredient release for continuous control. Uh, it's very durable, even under the most intense and harsh conditions and um, on harsh surfaces. Um, and it's a very efficient active ingredient uh, that facilitates a uh, lower use rate compared to, to uh, other pyrethroids. So now we'll do a, uh, a high level uh, overview of the labels for Talstar. 
uh, in scion insecticides. So you know that Tau Star, which is a golden standard, uh, contains the active ingredient bifenthrin, and uh, it's used to control pests both indoors and outdoors uh, in a variety of different uh, settings. And you know, as always, when whenever we're discussing labels, we want to make sure we're calling out the precautionary statements. So I'll do it here, but I won't do it for the Scion label. Um, but I just want to read that you know all pesticide handlers, which includes mixers, loaders, and applicators, must wear long sleeve shirts and long pants, socks, shoes, and chemical resistant gloves. And after the product is diluted in accordance with label directions for use and or when mixing and loading using a closed spray tank transfer system, shirt, pants, socks, shoes, and waterproof gloves are uh, sufficient. So I just wanted to highlight that specific section in the precautionary statement. So just uh, directions for use. So again, you all know that the label is the law. The label is the law. So you have to follow the label whenever you're making applications. Um, oftentimes we'll get questions, oh, well, you know, can we do this or can we do that? Uh, really, you need to follow the label because the label is the law. And if you can get creative uh, within those parameters, then, then by all means, but anything outside of those parameters is something that uh, would be going against uh, federal law. And so it is a violation of federal law to use the product uh, in a manner inconsistent with labeling. Um, and you also, do you also want to avoid making applications during uh, rain, which tends to be the case with most pesticides, um, just to ensure that you get uh, the most optimal control. Hey, so can, yes, five to 10 minutes, and then we can uh, move on to the Q&A. OK, sounds good. Um, additional application restrictions for residual outdoor surface and space sprays. Um, so just specifically calling out here uh, some specific session, sections that you want to be familiar with. And then these are specific areas of the label uh, where we talk about scorpion and spider control. Um, and so you can apply it as a coarse low pressure spray to areas that uh, pe these pests tend to inhabit. And we already went over what some of those areas are, uh, which includes, you know, baseboards, uh, storage areas, corners, uh, windows, attics, eaves. Um, and then you have your, your rates uh, that you can use uh, as well. And you, know, you can look at the label for that. Um, and then also perimeter treatment. So you can apply to a band of soil and vegetation six to 10 feet wide around and adjacent to the structure. Um, and also you wanna treat the foundation of the structure to the necessary height. Um, and then, of course, uh, at the uh, appropriate rates. Uh, specifically, when we're talking about scorpions, uh, there is a section on the label where we talk about pests being under slabs. Um, and so um, it is recommended that for infestations of scorpions um, that are inhabiting under slab areas, um, you can drill and inject, or you can do horizontal rotting and then uh, do injection uh, that way. And then for Scion, um, you know, I mentioned this is another product uh, that we, we've developed, uh, uses gamma cyhalothrin. And it's also, again, labeled for spiders and scorpions. Uh, just a specific call out here as it relates to, to scorpions for uh, clean out and severe infestations, uh, you want to use the 0.03% uh, uh, rate. Um, we have language in here about outdoor surfaces and perimeters which is uh, very similar to, to uh, Taustar. And that essentially are the uh, chemical treatments uh, that we can use, that we would recommend. Um, dusting is something that can also uh, be used uh, in combination uh, with uh, these other types of chemical control. Um, but, you know, again, just to summarize, we, we don't only want to rely on chemical control, but also those preventative measures that I did mention um, earlier. Um, and so with that said, that is the conclusion of the biology and management portion of the uh, webinar. And then I have some slides here just on True Champions, but Sam, I think everyone here is familiar with True Champions. So I don't think we have to really describe that. No, no they should be retained on, you know, they can always visit fmctruechampions.com for more information. But um, everyone 
everyone here should be a true champions member already. Okay. Okay, thank you, Rakim. Before we go into the Q&A section, I'm going to put a link in the chat to our quiz. You should all see it there. It's on SurveyMonkey. If you would, please click on that. It takes three to four minutes. It's a very easy, quick recap. Um, so if you would, please do that. This is a part of the CEU process. And while you do that, um, I will turn it over uh, for more Q&A. All right. So we have gotten a few questions in the uh, in the chat here with Tim. A um, couple of questions from Justin um, and Mauricio on lighting and insect attraction. I know that probably uh, pertains more to flying insects, but uh, do you have anything you can share just on different types of lighting and how that may or may not attract different pests? Yeah, absolutely. So, and I think I saw the question in regards to, to LED. So um, you're familiar with incandescent uh, lights, fluorescent lights, and you know, the, you know, a lot of those are very much associated with um, insect attraction and LED lights were, uh, for the longest time thought to not be associated with insect attraction and then you know some innovation occurred over the years where we learned that you know with specific wavelengths of uh light uh it can be attractive to to insects so really those shorter wavelengths of light and those cooler whites and the uh, bluish colors uh those tend to be associated with insect attraction um, whereas if you go on the opposite side of the spectrum, um, you will tend to see a reduction in attraction. And really, the reality is it, it can be quite variable depending on the species that you're working with. Uh, but often is the case that with those shorter wavelengths, uh, you will uh, have better attraction. And so, of course, like I said earlier, uh, the more insects that you can attract, uh, the, the better. Um, and not all of you will be dealing with uh, household residences, right? You might be dealing with a uh, maybe a restaurant structure or a hotel structure or some other larger building structure, right? So the typical lamps that you would find outside at a home are not necessarily going to be the lights that you would find at a more um, professional structure like a restaurant or a hotel. Oftentimes, those uh, types of buildings will have what are called fly lights. And those fly lights will, um, they could be fluorescent lights and some of them um, could be LED lights, right? So uh, if you are already at, um, if you're already servicing a property like that, it would be nice to know what type of light they are actually using at that property um, because you can determine whether or not that is an effective light that they are using. Um, and a good way to, to ascertain that, right, is uh, look at the sticky boards that you put in the lights. Uh, so those sticky boards, if they are, they tend to be heavily infested with insects, it's probably a good light that is associated with uh, good, uh, good control. Thanks for Kim. Um, so not too many questions in the chat at this point, so please uh, feel free to share. But uh, one other that we did get is we've had several questions on the size of various scorpion species or spider species in the U.S. Um, could you just make some broader comments on those? Yeah, so I mean, the scorpions really tend to range in size. And I think if you recall, and actually I meant to call this out uh, because it will show up on the quiz. So I mentioned that the striped-tailed scorpion is a medium-sized scorpion, um, but the, which one was it? The Arizona bark scorpion, it is not the larger species of scorpion. It's not the largest, uh, but that one, like I said, is the, the most uh, venomous. So really you could have a, a broad range of sizes, to be honest. And really the average size I would say is about seven inches long, um, half an inch to seven inches long uh, within uh, those different species. And the adults will tend to be 
they tend to average around four to five commonly, but even within the same species, you could have differences in, in size. Yeah, I know, especially when you're dealing with, you know, males and females, there's definitely variation between the, the size of the two sexes. Right. Uh, so it looks like we've got a series of questions that are coming in. Uh, more for you, Ed, if you want to take a look at the Q&A. Um, just a, a couple different questions there. Um, we did also get one question on tarantulas. Um, do you have anything you can share on tarantulas in the US for Kim? Do you want me to address that while he's looking? Sure. Yep. So tarantulas, um, and the reason I didn't really include tarantulas here is because they aren't typically something that we think of as being a pestilent species. Um, as you know, oftentimes tarantulas would be uh, considered pets, um, but tarantulas, of course, they, they are venomous and some bites, just like with spiders, uh, can be quite venomous um, and painful. Um, and tarantulas also have these, what are called urticating hairs, right? And so there are these hairs that uh, if you come into contact with them, they can actually uh, be, be quite painful. Um, now, just broadly speaking, the effects of bites associated with tarantulas is not nearly as well studied as it is with the spiders. Um, and we tend to think more about those urticating hairs and the pain, uh, the pain that's associated with the urticating hairs uh, compared to the actual bites associated with tarantulas. But, you know, tarantulas are definitely uh, something that is out there. Um, it's just not something that we tend to think of as, as a pest. Thanks for that, Rakim. Um, I think that is really about the end of the technical questions here. We do have a, a few miscellaneous things that we will follow up on either in the chat or via email after the webinar here. Um, but I, I think that is it for our technical questions, unless anything comes across here in the last couple seconds. Um, Ed, are there any things that, that you want to remind the group of in regards to CEUs? Uh, yeah, let me pull up my form real quick. Uh, it looks like there are only a few states that we need to get actual signatures from uh, attendees from. So uh, I, I just want to remind you, check your email on Monday. That will give you a recap on if you need to do anything for your CEUs. Uh, and again, if there are any issues, you can always email us. We work with the states on a monthly basis. Uh, and, and, you know, when as long as you're on the webinar and, and you're actively engaged and you take the quiz, they're usually very good about uh, making sure you get your credit. So uh, just, just a reminder, check your email on Monday for that recap. All right, thank you, Ed. Um, so we will follow up on other questions in emails afterwards or in the chat here. Uh, but thank you for joining us for First Friday and look for uh, further communications on CEU details for us on Monday and then certificates later on. Um, please also, uh, if you missed it in the chat at the beginning, uh, if you are a Talstar customer, uh, visit at Talstar 25th com to sign up for our sweepstakes. Um, just for uh, entering and for purchasing Calstar, you can get a chance to win a Ford F-150 or some other great prizes.